Okay, hi everyone. Um, this is Kirill Biloshenko from University of Nebraska. This is our seminar number 69. The speaker today is Professor Yaroslav Planter from Technical University Delft in uh, Netherlands. Uh, the talk will be about uh, cavity mechanics. Um, Professor Planter got his PhD in 1992 from Moscow Institute of Steel and Alloys in Russia where he studied with uh, Professor Andrei Varlamov. And then he held uh, postdoctoral positions at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany with Gerd Schoen, and then um, in the University of Geneva with uh, Marcus Bürger. After that, since uh, the year 2000, he has been a faculty member and currently a full professor at Kavli Institute of Nanoscience in Delft at uh, Delft University of Technology at, at, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Professor Blunter is a condensed matter theorist and uh, he has a wide range of research interests. And most recently he has been working on nano and opto mechanics, magnetics and electrons in low dimensional systems. So with this, I'll give it over to you, uh, Harislav. Uh, please go ahead with your talk. Thank you, Kirill. So I would like to start by thanking Kirill and Shin for inviting me here. That is really appreciated and particularly in the times where it's very difficult to travel. I will, after a very brief introduction, I will, I hope I will uh, have time to talk about three subjects. Uh, interaction of spin waves with optical light in optical cavities. So this is this topic. The next three topics are about microwave light and microwave cavities. And in the end, I will talk about something which is not about cavity magnonics, but people usually find it interesting. Uh, so that's about uh, Van der Waals, two-dimensional Van der Waals magnets and how you can probe the Dirac magnon spectrum. One second. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention your preference that if people have uh, clarifying questions during the talk, feel free to raise a hand and Professor Blunter will uh, call on you or I will call on you. But if you have questions over deeper nature, please reserve them uh, till the end of the talk. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. Now, this is the list of people with whom I uh, collaborated on the topics I'm going to cover. I, I cannot uh, really mention everybody. Uh, I, uh, there are, you, you see that there are quite a few experimental groups here. And I will mention Kanmin because he is in the audience. Uh, but I won't specifically mention a few people uh, with whom I collaborated on theory a lot on, 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 on these topics. So Herod Bauer is my long-term collaborator who is at Tahoku University. Uh, we jointly supervised the PhD student, Sanchar Sharma, who is now a postdoc at Max Planck at Erlangen, and a postdoc Tao Yu, uh, who uh, the two of them uh, have done most of the things I'm going to show. And the last part on two-dimensional Van der Waals magnets is the graduate work of my master student, Lara Ortmans. And, uh, of Sui Tsao Zhai, who is a faculty member at Nanjing University of Post and Communications and who visited my group in Delft for a year. Now, before I go to the next slide, I also have a disclaimer because I, I, what I want to say is that I don't have a background in magnetism. My background is actually in light matter interactions and I came to these topics from my interest in, in, in opto and nanomechanics. Which, which is okay, but uh, that means it's probably different from the background of most of you. And sometimes I will be saying something which you probably find strange or uh, even sometimes wrong. Don't worry, I think we will be able to figure this out. I mean, sometimes you will see that we speak different languages, but we will, we will figure out what, what's going on. Uh, now I will start from something which I assume we all know, uh, which are spin waves, 
which are elementary excitations of magnetic structure. So magnets for me are quanta of spin waves. I know that some people feel strongly about semantics. I don't. Uh, spin waves are easy to visualize, like for instance, in this example of a ferromagnetic chain. So if you have spins, which are in the ground state are all up, so that's a ferromagnet. Excitations are their precession around this preferred direction. And uh, this precession can be, can organize in a wave. And this is a, a spin wave. So it has a wavelength like from here to here. Uh, that's also a problem which can be easily solved theoretically. You can write a Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. And then in the simplest case, you get a parabolic dispersion. So the frequency is uh, quadratic in, uh, in the wave vector. Uh, there are more complicated situations. I will cover some of them today, but uh, uh, this, this is generally will be our subject. Now, this is basically to show the work of my colleague in Delft, uh, Tunus van der, van der Saar and his group. That's experimental pictures, imaging spin waves in, in YIC, yttrium iron garnet. Uh, and they uh, excite them by uh, strip lines. I will uh, talk later about that. And they detect these spin waves by NV center magnetometry. So they use NV centers in diamond. So that's a defect in diamond, which can be optically controlled and read out. And basically what this NV center measures is the local magnetic field. Uh, and they have, uh, on top of this YIG film, they have a diamond membrane, which has a lot of envy centers. And by reading information from those envy centers, they can get this kind of pictures, which is essentially a time uh, snapshot of, of, an, uh, of, of, of a propagating spin wave. Okay, now, uh, while many of us are interested in magnon spintronics, uh, including some people in the audience, and the usual motivation for this magnon spintronics is that we can have a different way of information transfer. I mean, now we have the silicon-based technology and the information is governed by electric currents. And electric currents, that's manipulation of the charge, uh, they are always associated with ohmic dissipation. Uh, now, uh, if we have... Uh, instead of manipulating charge, we would manipulate spin. Then instead of electric current, instead of charge current, we would have spin current, which is carried by spin waves. And it's not accompanied, if, if, if it's in, in an insulator, it's not accompanied by ohmic dissipation. So we only have some intrinsic damping of spin waves, which is much weaker than ohmic dissipation. And that's well, that, that's, that's a pathway towards non-dissipative information transfer. Of course, we are not anyway close to, uh, no, close to, to the te technical applications, to industrial applications, but this is a motivation which is driving the whole field. And if we are serious about that, then we should be able to excite, manipulate, and read out spin waves. And okay, that's of course, there have been a lot of research already. There are several ways, ways of uh, excite and manipulate and read them out. I already talked about NV center readout. This is another example. This is electrical excitation and readout. This is an example of a technique developed in, uh, in the group of Bart van Wees in Groningen. They use, uh, that's also YIC, and they use platinum contacts on top of YIC. Uh, platinum is a metal with strong spin orbit coupling, and because of that, it has spin hole effect. And they use spin hole effect to convert to convert charge into spin. So they pass current through this platinum lead, and they they create a lot of spin waves in YIC. And by another platinum electrode, they use inverse spin hole effect and they can read out those, uh, uh, those uh, spin waves. 
But okay, those techniques are, which I mentioned are relatively recent. Now there is a mainstream which has been used for really many, many years. And the mainstream is optical control. So use electromagnetic radiation to control, to excite, and to read out spin waves. And that's something which people were doing with brilliant light scattering since at least the 60s. Now the reason why I give this talk today, and we are not, now we are moving actually to the topic of my talk, is that the recent development was to use cavities, electromagnetic cavities, so optical cavities for uh, optical light and microwave cavities for microwave light. I will talk about both. Because in cavities, you have increased enhanced light intensity, and that leads to much stronger coupling between magnets and electromagnetic radiation. And that's a development which started about five, six years ago, and it's opened the whole field. Uh, and uh, now I will go to the uh, core subject of my talk on the next slide, but I just want to mention that a group of people, uh, which include Kanmin and include myself, have written a review article with the title Cavity Magnonics, and we are almost ready to put it on archive. So all of the things I'm going to talk about in this first part of my talk will be there and a lot of other things. So watch out, we hope to have it next week on archive. Okay, so uh, let me now go to first two optical cavities. Uh, now in this cavity, business people are using YIC because uh, YIC has uh, outstanding magnetic quality. Uh, now, in, in particular, for optical cavities, YIC is transparent. So if you take a YIC, transparent for light. So if you take a YIC sphere, it's not just a magnet with very good magnetic qualities. It's also an optical cavity. It's so-called whispering gallery mode cavity. I will talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, so it supports photons. Uh, which, which actually uh, rotate, go around the equator. And this uh, has been explored in these three experiments in three different groups. So the group of Nakamura at the University of Tokyo, the group of Hong Tang at Yale, and uh, uh, this group, uh, so with the first author of, uh, is James Hay in Cambridge. They have all done this experiment. So this particular picture is from, from, from the Nakamura group. They uh, looked at brilliant light scattering in this configuration. So they take an optical waveguide. It's actually far infrared, but it uh, doesn't matter. And they put the X sphere next to this waveguide. So the X sphere is evanescently coupled to the waveguide and they look at the transmission through the waveguide as a function of frequency, and that's what they see. Now they actually see uh, the main feature which they don't show is the central peak. So that corresponds to light, which enters with certain frequency, doesn't interact with the sphere and goes through. Because it's evanescently coupled, I mean, most of the photons just do that. And uh, this is a very large peak, which is not interesting. Now, on top of that, they see two side peaks, stokes on the left and anti-stokes on the right. Uh, and that's because of the interaction with magnets. So the uh, photons in the waveguide couple to his whispering gallery modes and whispering gallery modes interact with magnets. And that's an elastic scattering. And that's why you can excite magnets and then you have uh, uh, higher frequencies or absorbed magnets, you have lower frequencies. And what they saw is a very large asymmetry between stokes and anti-stokes. You see, this is in decibel. So uh, that's three orders of magnitude difference between stokes and anti-stokes. And whichever is stronger depends on the input polarization of light. So the light has two polarizations, which are TM and TE. And depending on what you send, you either have stokes bigger or anti-stokes bigger. And that's something which we wanted to understand. And Sanchar, Herit, and myself developed a theory, and I will very briefly outline what we have done. 
that's our theoretical setup, which is very close to experimental setup. We have also waveguide, a sphere. We fix the magnetization by applied magnetic field perpendicular to the waveguide for technical reasons, but that also corresponds to the experiments. And we can look at transmission and reflection. Uh, and I will show you what, what we found, but let's first go through the details. First, whispering gallery modes are, as I said, those are photons which are living in this sphere. They are confined. And if you want to uh, describe them quantitatively, we have to solve wave equation on a sphere. And wave equation has Laplace operator, so that the same as, you know, a hydro equation for hydrogen atom, for the, for the electron hydrogen atom, it's most of us teach that at some point. Uh, so that's the solutions are characterized by three quantum numbers. So the principal quantum number, the orbital quantum number, which is basically the uh, angular momentum of the photon, and the magnetic quantum number. And in this regime, so for the frequencies we are interested in, uh, uh, the modes are basically equally spaced. So the distance between uh, the neighboring modes, uh, which is uh, called the free spectral range, in, uh, in the uh, parameter regime corresponding to those experiments is a few terahertz. Uh, the light itself is, uh, as I said, far infrared, so it's 100 terahertz or whatever. Now there is an important detail, which would be very important later. Uh, the dispersion for two different polarization is slightly shifted because of biofringence. So that's basically we have equally spaced modes, but each mode is slightly split by a few gigahertz because of this biofringence. Now magnets, there are a lot of different magnets in the system, but we are only interested in two types. For transmission, light comes with some wave factor, interacts with a magnet, comes back and goes up with a, almost the same wave factor. Now the deficit of the wave factor goes to the angular momentum of the photon, so to the difference of the angular momentum of whispery gallery modes, and this difference is exactly the angular momentum of a magnet. Now I should have said that for the magnets we have to solve the landau lipschitz equation on a sphere, and again of course we have a Laplace operator, so again we have three quantum numbers, uh, which now correspond, this LS, for instance, is the angular momentum of a magnet. So for transmission, this LS uh, or originates from the difference of the wave factor, and it's small. So we are talking about uh, Volcker modes, so the modes with the small angular momentum. And in particular, in those experiments, the only mode which was important is the Kittel mode. So the homogeneous magnet. Later, there were also experiments done by James Hay, which we also collaborated with them for theoretical description, where they were able to create a homogeneous magnetic field and excite higher modes, but I don't have time to talk about them. So in the experiment, they only talked at, uh, looked at, Kittel, at the Kittel mode. Now, theoretically, we can also look at reflection, and in reflection, light comes with K, and goes back with minus k, which means there is a deficit of uh, angular, of sorry, of uh, wave factor of 2k, which eventually goes to the angular momentum of a magnet. And in this situation, what is important uh, are uh, magnets with a large angular momentum. Uh, and actually, those two quantum numbers should be approximately the same. And those are Damon Asberg modes. And Damon Asberg modes are surface modes which are chiral. They can only go in one direction. Uh, I will come to them later in films. They will be also easier to visualize, but that's important enough in our story. Now let's talk about interaction. Uh, interaction comes from this Hamiltonian, which is the easiest, the simplest Hamiltonian you can write. So you have the energy of electric field, you have the energy of magnetic field, and you have interaction of magnetization with magnetic field. Interaction is sitting here. So all this, what is called magneto-optical effects, in this situation, come from the dependence of the dielectric tensor on the magnetization. And that's something which has been known since the 50s. 
well, basically you take a textbook and you have elastic magneto-optical effects, which are Faraday and Atomuton. You also have inelastic effects, which are uh, excitation, well, emission and absorption of magnets. And that's exactly what we need. And for both elastic and inelastic, we know how to write this tensor. We can write the tensor, we can expand it, we can now quantize the magnets using Halstein Primakov transformation. I will not go into detail, I will show you the Hamilton. That's the Hamiltonian we get. So the first term are whispering gallery modes. So that's a bunch of harmonic oscillators. That's what you usually get in quantum optics. I mean, electromagnetic waves are harmonic oscillators, no problem. Second term are a bunch of magnet modes. So these P's and alphas are modes, different modes. And again, magnets are harmonic oscillators if you are in the linear regime, nothing surprising. And this is the interaction Hamiltonian. So A's are uh, photons and C's are magnons. And for instance, this term describes an absorption of a magnet. So you annihilate a magnet, you annihilate a photon, you create another photon, and the Hermitian conjugate uh, describes uh, emission of a magnet. Uh, now that's written in a way like uh, every two photon modes, whispering gallery modes interact with any magnet mode. In practice, of course, you always have uh, uh, selection rules. And one important selection rules is that you have to change polarization of light. It comes from the conservation of angular momentum. Now you also have orbital selection rules and for they are different for for the Kittel mode you have that which is actually surprisingly similar to the selection rules for emission of electrons in a hydrogen atom uh, but uh, for uh, Damon Ashbach modes you have different selection rules which look funny but they just express the fact that you can only create I, I already mentioned that the Damon Ashbach modes are chiral, they only go in one direction. So these selection rules tell you that you can create magnets in one direction, but which they go anyway, but you cannot create them in the opposite direction. Uh, and I don't, I'm not going to develop this topic, but 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 this Hamiltonian is very similar to Hamiltonian people get in optomechanics. And, and that's actually, you can, you can go into more serious analogies and find some effects which are known in optomechanics and transfer them here and another way around and also look at differences, but I don't have time for that. That's a cartoon of our theoretical results. The, uh, that shows uh, the central peak in, in blue and Stokes, anti-Stokes in, in red. They're not up to scale, but uh, that's important. Whatever is bigger is, is also supposed to be bigger in the calculations. So top row is transmission, bottom row is reflection, TE, TM are input polarizations of light and plus minus are input direction. Because now in this story, uh, depending on where you send the light from here or here, because magnetization is fixed, they are not, the, the two directions are not equivalent. And you see, indeed, we find uh, that if you, uh, that there is a strong asymmetry between Stokes and anti-Stokes. And if you swap input polarization, you swap the order. Also, if you swap the input direction, you swap the order. For reflection, which has not been brought experimentally, we find something else. And this something else is that we only have either Stokes or anti-Stokes, and we don't have another one. So let's try to understand this. Let's first try to understand transmission. These are the results we get for transmission for the intensity of Stokes and anti-Stokes peaks, and they are almost textbook. So these factors are because of losses, and if we have the system optimally coupled, they're just equal one. We have these uh, probabilities. Uh, so the coupling matrix elements, absolute value squared, we have a number of magnets plus one and uh, and n. That's a, that's a asymmetry between spontaneous stimulated emission, 
And then we have the Lorentz and denominator. And actually this big difference comes from Lorentz and denominator and let's understand it on this picture. And this is uh, what I explained in words. So this is supposed to be the spectrum of uh, whispering gallery modes. I exaggerate a little bit, but these two and these two and these two correspond to the same orbital quantum numbers, but opposite polarizations T and TM and they're slightly split. So this distance is a free spectral range and that's supposed to be much bigger than this distance. Now we imagine we are driving this mode and we want to excite a magnet. So it means we have to go to lower energy. So we have to go here and that's easy because this, this distance uh, in energy is a few gigahertz. You can even make it resonant with a magnet uh, and that's a resonant process. But if you want to emit a magnet, we have to go here. Uh, no, I think I'm confusing things. If you want to emit, we go here. If you want to excite, we go. Uh, if, if you want to emit, we go here. If you want to absorb, we go here. And that's a few terahertz. So this process is never resonant. So emission and absorption of a magnet, we have a competition between resonant and off resonant process. And of course the resonant process wins. And we have in this situation a Stokes peak much higher than anti-stokes. And for instance, if I if you stop driving a TM mode, then it's we swap the order. So then this process is resonant and this process is off resonant. And then anti-stokes would be much bigger. Now one word for reflection. For reflection, now this uh, matrix element starts playing a role. Uh, remember I told you we can only either excite or emit. So one of those matrix elements is zero. And that's why we only have stokes and not anti-stokes or we only have anti-stokes and not stokes. Now to finish with the optical part, I see I'm already at half an hour. Uh, let me mention that this situation actually means magnet cooling. So if Stokes is much bigger than anti-Stokes in this situation or in this situation, it means it's much easier to excite magnets than to emit magnets, than to absorb magnets. So we are exciting more and more magnets, we are heating magnets. But if anti-Stokes is much bigger, then we preferably uh, absorb magnets. So we are cooling magnets down. So this process can be used for cooling down the magnets. And if we are seriously in this situation, we can cool them down, formally speaking, to zero. If we are in this situation, we never cool them down to zero, but this is still a mechanism for cooling magnets down. And we have written a paper where we actually looked at, at the details of this. Uh, we asked questions, what is the cooling temperature and what is the needed intensity of laser? to cool it down efficiently. And I don't want to go into all these details. I just mentioned that we have a minimal model for that, which uh, contains three optical modes and one magnet mode. The answer was that we can, down, we can cool it down by a factor. So maybe by a factor of 10, but definitely not 10 to the five, like sometimes they can make it in uh, optomechanics. And the intensity of laser is something which is feasible. So that's an experiment which in principle with probably some effort, but can be done now. Uh, now let me go to microwave uh, cavities. Uh, and here that's actually people started with microwave cavities. There have been a theoretical prediction by Soikal and Michael Flatte in 2010 that the coupling of a Yig sphere with a cavity, with a microwave cavity will be strong. And that have been observed first by Hans Hubel in Munich uh, uh, in films, in Yig films. This is the experiment again from the group of Nakamura. And there was this experiment by Hong Tang a bit later, very similar. So they take a, a, uh, they take a Yig sphere and put it in a cavity. And this current is just a control parameter. So uh, uh, now here, uh, the frequency in this case, it's about 10 gigahertz. You can make 
magnum, in this case, that's a ketel mode again, you can make it resonant to the cavity. So if it's resonant, you can have a crossing. And in this case, because of interaction, that's an avoided crossing. And I don't want to go into formal parameter evaluation, but you can see that here the frequency is 10 gigahertz, the crossing is 200 megahertz. So for my background in optomechanics, that's an insanely strong coupling. People in optomechanics would dream to have this coupling. They, they really try a lot of things and they cannot achieve it. And here it just comes easily. Now that's so strong that you can actually start talking about quantum magnonics. So the same group uh, a few years ago demonstrated by putting a magnet and a qubit in the same cavity, demonstrated coherent coupling of qubit and magnum mediated by the cavity. They managed to, to, to show that you can bring a magnet in a superposition state. There have been a few follow-up experimental papers and that opened a lot of theoretical research. We also participated with this proposal by uh, Merdat Eliassi and Herit and myself, how you can create magnet entanglement. And that's something which is right now developing and, and that's one of these subfields. I'm not going to talk about that, but I will give you a few examples of unusual physics. So the physics will be classical, but still, still very unusual. And I will, uh, I will probably not go into deep in, de in details in view of the time, but, but let me try to cover as much as I can. Now, one story is about Yik films. Uh, we already talked about Damon Ashbach modes and Damon Ashbach modes in film are also surface modes. So they propagate perpendicular to magnetization. Uh, and for example, here, if magnetization is in this direction, the mode propagating along the top surface would go to the right and the long bottom surface would go to the left. Uh, so they don't backscatter, they're really chiral. Uh, well, I mean, there are some, some, some caveats to that. I will, I will come to that, but, but that's, that's the usual picture we think about. Now let me also show you the experiment which has been done in the group of Hai Min Yu uh, at Beijing Normal University. They take a Yik film, they put on a Yik film an array of uh, cobalt, uh, cobalt uh, uh, strips. And with this array, so they can drive them. And, and with this array, they can uh, excite waves, spin waves of the wavelength compatible with this distance. Uh, they can actually excite multiple modes. Now they uh, detect those modes by, uh, by measuring microwave transmission. So they have these uh, strip lines and they can measure transmission from this line to this line. And what they see is something strange. So they see that, for instance, if you look here, transmission to the right has a peak corresponding to this magnet mode, one of the modes and transmission to the left has no peak. Now you can say, fine, we started with Damon Ashbach modes. Maybe we just see the mode which goes to the right and we don't see the mode which goes to the left because it doesn't exist. I mean, it's on the bottom and we cannot see it. Now, the problem is that this film is very thin. And if the film is thin, it cannot support Damon Ashbach modes because Damon Ashbach modes have certain length scale decaying in the bulk. And if the film is thinner than this length scale, then there are no separate chiral modes. Then those two modes are basically merge. And, and there is just, there are modes which, which exist throughout the whole film propagating in both directions. So in this sense, this result is very unusual because we would expect to have both, but we only see one. And uh, that's what uh, Tao Yu uh, developed the theory. So published in, oops, in the paper, which I probably have on one of the latest slides and also in the, in the experiment. Uh, we looked at, uh, at this uh, situation, which corresponds to the experiment. So the Yik uh, and these magnetic strips. Uh, and we are looking at uh, spin waves close to the ferromagnetic resonance. 
Uh, well, basically, we solve technically, yeah, this is the paper. Uh, we, we solve uh, the Landau Lifshitz equation, uh, that's usual business, uh, and then we calculate the, uh, the uh, microwave transmission. Uh, now, what, what we discovered, okay, so that there is spin momentum locking, that's probably not discovered, I mean, it's something which is known, uh, that uh, the uh, pol uh, polarization of spin waves going, propagating in a certain direction is also in a certain direction. So you see here you have mz minus my with plus or minus here, depending on whether it goes left or right. And because of that, you can calculate the dipolar, uh, dipolar magnetic fields generated by the spin waves. And because of the spin momentum locking, you would see that uh, waves propagating to the right only create dipolar fields to the top of the film and waves propagating to the left only create magnetic fields, stray fields to the bottom of the film. And that means that only, uh, only uh, spin waves traveling to the right are coupled to those magnetic strips. So only waves traveling to the right are excited and spin waves traveling to the left are there, but they're not excited. And that's exactly why you only see like if they, pro well, not, not like, but they really propagate in one direction, but that's a unidirectional excitation. Now, uh, there are a lot of uh, things here. I mean, what I explained is a very simple situation. There are things which are more complicated. I mean, it depends on whether the uh, polarized, uh, sorry, the magnetization of the strips is parallel or anti-parallel to EEC. It depends whether the coupling here is dipolar or exchange because dipole, dipolar would support this. Exchange would actually uh, make this effect less visible. Uh, whether polarization is really circular or it could be elliptic and elliptic would again uh, create some fields on the wrong side. So that's our calculation. I will not explain all the details, but you see that experiment is here and we have the model, so this is the, the mode, uh, different points are different magnet modes, which can be excited. And you see that the experiment is in between different curves, which correspond to different parameters, different things included. So we can describe the experiment, but, but, but there are a lot of details which go much beyond what I said. Uh, let's see, 30 a, uh, 39 minutes. Okay, yeah, let, let me mention that. I was talking about an array, but of course the situation is more general. We can just put one magnetic wire and with this one wire excite unidirectionally spin waves which only go in one direction. And again, that's already is being used by experimentalists. So this experiment I showed on slide two by my colleagues in Dell, that's exactly what they are doing. So they just put one wire and then they excite spin waves, which go in one direction. They detect them here. They don't detect anything on this side. Okay, now let me go through this story. I will go uh, even more quickly. Uh, now that's level repulsion and attraction. So that's something which we probably know generally from general quantum mechanics. So if you have two, uh, two levels and, and the levels have to cross, and they, 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 they interact, then usually we have this level repulsion. I already showed you one example with the cavity and catalogue. Now, okay, if there is no interaction, they just cross and that's it, they don't do anything. But there could be a situation with level attraction. So sometimes you see that. Now, when do you see this? Okay, that's a simple quantum mechanical situation. Like if you have two levels, E1 and E2, you have coupling G, you can write a two by two, you know, matrix, you can solve an equation. This is what you, what you, what you come to. And if G squared is positive as, as it should be, you will always get level repulsion. That's what we learn in basic quantum mechanics. Now, if G squared is negative, formally, you could have a level attraction. So this thing at some point would become imaginary and, and, and the levels would come to each other and would do that. 
Now, why why should G become become imaginary so that G squared is negative? That's possible if you have dissipative coupling. So if you have something, if you have dissipation in your system, and uh, this dissipation can actually induce not coherent coupling, but dissipative coupling. And now let me show you one more experiment. Uh, which was done by Bimu Yao, who was at the time in the group of uh, Kanmin uh, Kui in Manitoba. Uh, this is actually, for whatever reason, that's a nice experience of me being the last author on an experimental paper. That's my only experimental paper when I'm the last author. I'm very proud of it. Uh, so these are actually experimental pictures. And uh, what uh, they have done, they have a waveguide which we can consider as a lossy cavity. It's actually not exactly a waveguide, that's a fabri perot cavity, but it's very lossy. Uh, and in a cavity, there is some way X sphere. Uh, and the parameter they can change, they have orientation of magnetic field, which they can rotate. And they see that depending on the angle of the orientation of magnetic field, they can go from this situation, which is clearly level uh, repulsion, to this situation, which is level attraction. And, uh, uh, and okay, so uh, that's that's clearly something is going on. And we had a theory, so uh, Tao produced a theory and we understood what is going on. Uh, I will not show you any formulas, but I will try to explain you what's happening. So we have two times of photons here. So there are localized waves in a cavity because that's after all, it's a cavity. But we also have continuous waves which are traveling away from resonances. So localized waves are at resonances, continuous waves are away from resonances. And localized waves are leading to level repulsion as usual. Uh, they, they are coherently coupled uh, to, to, uh, so to, to Yik, but these uh, traveling waves, they take the energy away, so they lead to dissipation and they, uh, they are, this coupling is dissipative, so that leads to level attraction. And we have a competition between level repulsion and level attraction. And one more thing which I want to mention is that the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, because of course, if you want the imaginary coupling that leads to a non hemisian Hamiltonian, that's actually a search field which originated a long time ago in relation to completely different systems. Uh, and it, it looks like the features are in many very different systems, the features are very, very similar. Okay, and that, that's basically it. So we, we have a theory which indeed confirms that there is a level attraction which goes into level, sorry, level repulsion which goes into level attraction. Now, in view of the time, I'm at 45 minutes. I'm actually inclined to skip this part and give for five minutes to two-dimensional Van der Waals magnet. Is it a good plan? Uh, I'm just looking at our organizers. It's up to you, Yaroslav. If it's just yeah, five well, it depends on how serious you are about me finishing in 45 minutes. No, not serious at all. You... Okay, then let me skip Please. the current part. That's a very interesting part. I would be happy to come to it in the end in the question session if you want. I will go straight to Van der Waals magnets. And that's well, a new, new class of materials which have been around for, uh, well, I mean, three dimensional Van der Waals magnets have, has, have been around forever, but they have been synthesized in two dimensional form only for the first time, maybe five years ago. And people started to work with them only really a few years ago. So magnets, well, I mean, there are different families. I will not be talking about all of them. Uh, they are, well, they're like graphene. I mean, they are just layered materials which are covalently coupled in the layer and van der Waals coupled between the layers. You can have monolayers, you can have bilayers. Uh, they are coupled something, I mean, different materials are coupled differently. This is what is called AB stacking. So this is uh, here, red is one layer and uh, uh, black is another layer on top of that. 
the materials I have in mind when talking about that is are chromium collides, chromium chloride, bromide, and iodide. But there are also other materials of this type. Uh, so that's really a variety. I mean, new materials are being synthesized. They have very interesting properties, but I will only concentrate on what I really need to. So I will concentrate on magnon spectrum. You can easily calculate the spectrum. I mean, you can take the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian with an isotropy, and you can do it for a monolayer analytically. You can do it for bilayer analytically. We have done it for a bilayer. You end up with a Dirac spectrum. So it's like electrons in graphene. So you have Dirac points where for a monolayer without an isotropy, you have just, just Dirac points with a linear dispersion. If you have a bilayer or if you have an isotropy, you have a gap open. But anyway, that's a very different spectrum from usual quadratic spectrum in ferromagnetic chains or lattices. And the question is, uh, can we see this magnets at the Dirac points? Because the point is, of, the, the problem is, of course, electrons are fermions. So you can just fill them in up to the Dirac point and you can explore the Dirac point physics. Magnets are bosons. So if you start pumping magnets, they would go down. First, they would go to the bottom of the band, which is perfectly parabolic. There is nothing interesting happening here. And you, when, when, when you have them, when you have the Dirac points filled up, then you have already a bunch of magnets, a lot of magnets sitting here. And you are actually, for these for this, uh, energies, you're already close to the, <coughs> sorry, to the Curie transition temperature. So it's very difficult to probe those. Now we need some properties which would be only sensitive to the Dirac points. And this property is known that's Berry curvature, which is just a property of spectrum like that. And for instance, uh, Lara has calculated it for, for our bilayer spectrum. Berry curvature is zero almost everywhere except for the Dirac points. And at the Dirac points, it's non zero. And well, I mean, if you have been exposed to this topological properties, I mean, topological insulators, people start talks about that or papers about that with the Berry curvature. So that's the notion which is uh, extremely well understood and known in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this field. Uh, now, the problem is, of course, if you just have usual, uh, usual, uh, mono bilayers, then the topology is what is called trivial. You see here, the uh, for the two bands, the Berry curvature is opposite. And because of that, you cannot have any non-trivial properties. Whatever you do, you will get some of the two bands and they will add up to zero. You need to have non-trivial topology. And for this, you need to break the inversion symmetry. And formally, uh, that, that's now this paper, which uh, Siri Tao uh, have, uh, have done. So formally, we decided to break the symmetry by adding to two layers. We are talking about a bilayer. We are adding to this bilayer these terms with plus or minus with different layers. And this you can do, for example, by doping the bilayer with electrons in one layer and hole in another way. That's perfectly feasible. People can do it. There are some issues which I might come back later to, uh, but, but in principle, that's a perfectly valid Hamiltonian. I, sorry, I forgot to say that all those systems, well, not all of them, but most of those systems are insulators. So again, there are no electrons in the picture. We're only talking about magnets. Now the property we have decided to look at is the, uh, okay, so yeah, this shows that the Berry curvature for both bands is uh, uh, the same. Now that's all fine. The property we decided to look at is energy current, which you can express, you can write the thermal hole conductivity of magnets. You can write it like this. You can calculate it. You will, you will get it like this. Now the sum here is over bands, which is N and K, which is uh, the wave vectors. So we are summing over all bands and we are integrating over the brilliant zone. 
Now the C is some complicated function of, of the frequency of the magnets, which, uh, which is originating from, from some integral, integrals of the Bose functions. But what is important, it only depends on the frequency. And here you have the Berry curvature. Now the problem is that because you have two Dirac points, K and K prime, and they are exactly at the same energy, the Berry curvature at the two Dirac points are opposite. And the total thermal hole conductivity is zero. So you cannot measure the thermal hole conductivity. That's actually maybe even good because the total thermal hole conductivity is not only contributed to magnets, it might be contributed to something else. Well, thermal conductivity is also contributed to phonons, but phonons don't uh, interact with magnetic field. Okay, anyway. But what is not zero is the difference. Is uh, if so, if you sum up the contribution of k and k prime points, you will get zero. But if you take a difference, it's not zero. They're actually exactly the same. So the difference is twice that. So that's all great. The problem is, of course, how we are going to measure it. And for this, we have a proposal. The proposal is to take and this H shape system. Well, we actually have two proposals. I will only talk about one. Uh, and uh, apply here a gradient of temperature. If you apply temperature gradient between this and this edge, you actually inject magnets. And then because magnets you inject at K and K prime points, I mean, K points go this side, K prime points go, 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 go this side. So we don't care about K prime points, but we do care about K points because we are going to detect them on this part of the edge. Uh, we can do it with applying another gradient or measuring, measuring, measuring uh, heat flux. Uh, so uh, in the end of the day, uh, what, whatever, whatever we are going to detect will be only sensitive to the K point magnets, but not to the K prime point magnets. Okay, that's hand waving. We can also calculate that. Uh, and this is yeah, more or less to convince you that I'm not just hand waving, but we also have something to show. You probably are not very much familiar with these numbers, which, which we put here for the, for the thermal hole conductivity. Just believe me that those are numbers which are measurable. They're actually higher than what you usually measure in semiconductors. So that's a measurable effect. Uh, uh, we, we are thinking in chromium bromide. In chromium bromide, the Curie temperature is 34 Kelvin. We start seeing significant effect above 15 Kelvin, which is okay. I mean, we still have room between 15 and 34. We actually looked at the lashinsky marie interaction, which actually suppressed the effect. But of course, if they are very strong, then you have other topological effects, which we didn't take into account. An elephant in the room is damping which we didn't take into account, we assumed it's small. But if you start, I mean, we need uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, generate this term, we propose to dope this insulator with magnets, sorry, with electrons and holes. And of course, if we start having free electrons and holes, we increase damping. And that's something where we need to find a balance between this term u, which we need to break the symmetry, and the damping, which we don't want to be too much. We made some estimates. We believe that the, the balance can be found, but that's again something which probably deserves some further investigation. I think I will stop here. These are my conclusions. I, I was talking about four uh, themes. Uh, one was uh, interaction of spin waves with optical light. And we have seen uh, a symmetry between Stokes and anti-Stokes peaks in brilliant light scattering. And we have also talked a little bit about magnet cooling. We talked about, uh, uh, about unidirectional excitation of spin waves in microwave cavities or with microwaves, let's say. I didn't talk, I skipped uh, the chiral interaction between magnets in a waveguide. 
Uh, I talked a little bit about dissipative coupling and how it is responsible for level attraction and actually crossover between level repulsion and attraction. And in this last part, I talked about how we can probe the Dirac spectrum of two-dimensional Van der Waals magnets, and that can be done by uh, Valley thermal hold effect. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Yaroslav, uh, for this interesting talk. Um, let's, uh, let's use the uh, clap button in Zoom to thank him. So we are ready to take questions. Please raise your hand if you have one. Um, I, I see Alex. Alexei, please go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, Yaroslav. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, so I, I have a question about the last part. Uh, so, uh, so did you actually check that the main contribution to this whole effect comes from the vicinity of Dirac point? Because so we did some calculations on biomagnons and even though the berry curve, which is kind of peaked around the gap, but other regions of brilliant zone also contribute because simply, even though berry curve, which is small there, but because temperature is kind of, is uh, uh, like basically creates distribution that is present everywhere and might be kind of, uh, might uh, make, might emphasize other parts of the brilliant zone as well. Okay, yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure here we have taken into account all case. Uh, we didn't just, uh, ju not just the brilliant zone. I'm pretty sure that the contribution in this case is from the brilliant zone magnets. Uh, but I would be happy, I mean, if you have this written somewhere, I would be happy to look at it and, and see. Uh, what it, are the differences? It's, it's about file magnets. I, I can send you the reference. But uh, basically, okay. our conclusion was that we are, by this whole type responses, we are not only probing uh, just Dirac magnets, but we would probe also something else. No, no, yes, I, 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 see, I see your point. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would say our conclusion is that we are still with this particular valley, uh, valley what is it, valley thermal hall effect. We are probing Dirac magnets. But I, yes, I can imagine that could be different situations, whatever. So I would be happy to- I mean, that. basically you could try to split the integral into two parts uh, or summation and uh, see how large are other contributions to the total integral, for example. No, no, I, I, I absolutely understand what you're, what you're saying, yeah. All right, okay, yeah. Again, yeah, thank you. you should even start take, taking notes. Okay. In thank you. Uh, further questions, please. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Patton, please go ahead. Unmute. Hi, that was an excellent talk. I'm not a theoretician, but uh, you had me fascinated all the way through until you got to Vanderbals. <laughs> but uh, uh, I do have a couple of questions from the very beginning of your talk, which is really the stuff I'm most familiar with. Uh, uh, yeah, first of all, how big is your YIG sphere? Uh, that's, uh, I, uh, okay, so I, I believe that's half a millimeter. Okay, half a millimeter. That's pretty well, small. That's don't, pretty... Well, well, I would say it's, <laughs> for, for me, I would say it's big. Okay. But I think that technically it's uh, limited by the quality of the, of the surface. Well, that's my next question. Yes, uh, exactly. Making polished YIG spheres is difficult. And uh, abs abs Absolutely. Actually, all the effects I mentioned, like for instance, cooling would be way more efficient if you would have a sphere of a micron, but as oh, far as I understand, micron. that's not, nobody can, can, for whatever reason, which I, as a theorist, cannot really understand, but everybody whom I talk to say that they cannot polish spheres down below several hundred microns 
because some technology doesn't work or whatever. And if you have too much surface disorder, that kills all the effects. Well, you're, 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 you're thinking of spheres a lot smaller than the YIG spheres that Phillips used to make and were expert at polishing. But uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that of course needs to be, uh, uh, well, okay, if it's not YIG, uh, then it should be something which is insulating and transparent as soon right. as. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you another question about the sphere thing. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I remember Walker giving his paper on Walker modes along, I'm pretty old. So I remember Walker giving his original paper and uh, you know, the modes that uh, the people would measure that would correlate with Walker's theory were, like I said, large spheres. And you could see the modes which are pretty much bulk modes. And uh, you know, I know a little bit about whispering gallery modes from microwave devices, but uh, I suppose you're talking about high, high order modes that are circulating around? Yes, uh, actually, yes, indeed. So if you're talking about whispering gallery modes, we are talking really high order modes. High order I, modes. I am afraid to give any number, but I think eyes would be like hundreds. Right, well, sure, in that limit, they, they would be what microwave device people call whispering gallery modes, but in a, in a totally different kind of order. Uh, and I never thought of the, the Damon Eschbach modes as going around a sphere, but you're right, they certainly do. And in Walker's original paper, he actually shows modes on his dispersion curve that are above the spin wave band, which he identifies. Back then, they didn't know about surface, didn't call them surface modes, but I guess he called them evanescent modes or something like that. So yeah, yeah, it's very absolutely. interesting to have you bring up uh, all of these ideas, which I remember from long ago in the context of this really cool experiment that you're doing. Let me ask you a question about the platinum strips, uh, strips on the YIG that you also showed. Okay, that you are now asking me about something I haven't done, but I know it from Bartius. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna try to ask you experimental questions, but actually, actually a lot of things I've never thought of, but I never thought of not See, we'd normally excite the uh, surface modes and the backward volume modes and YIG with strip lines. And uh, I suppose people are using the, the uh, spin hall effect to excite them the way you're showing. Are, are there a lot of experiments on doing this? I, I don't know of any myself, but- uh, I, I, I know that this technique, uh, they, at least if I talk to them, to Bart and to Rembert, they think they are the first ones okay. uh, in 2015. If you ask me how many groups are using it right now, I think I've heard, uh, okay, don't, you know, uh, don't use it against me. Oh. I think uh, Saito was using that. Uh, I think maybe some other groups, but maybe I'm also, maybe I'm talking trash. Okay, are they using pulses or are they exciting the platinum with microwave currents? No, no, but this is sorry. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm confusing. So this is about uh, this is just about passing DC current through platinum. Oh, a DC current. Okay, okay. Uh, you, you can also. I mean, th there are a lot of people using like, like I mean, this one. That's basically this is the same experiment, but they don't need platinum. They're using gold because they don't need. Right. Effect, okay. And this you can excite. Okay. Uh, if, if I can just uh, chime in here, this is uh, what's called a uh, magnum drag effect. It was theoretically proposed by Professor Shu Feng Zhang, who's also in the audience at this moment. And uh, in terms of the experiment technique, actually, uh, our colleague Barry Zink at the University of Denver also doing something similar okay. along this line. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to ask any more questions, but uh, Yaroslav is a great talk. I'm gonna send you an email and try to get a copy of it. And then I would like to visit with you one-on-one uh, -on -one so you can answer, answer some more questions if you don't mind. Okay, thank you, sure. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Uh, I, I, I see, oh, I, I think I see one hand, uh, Christina. 
You will, your, your voice, your audio system seems to be broken down. Christina, please go ahead, just ask a question. Oh, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. I have a short question with respect to frustrated magnets with competing interactions. So some of them, they are, they have, they are magnetic and also ferroelectric. So they have an electric polarization. Um, so would that be a way to couple uh, the microwave cavity, couple the electric field of the electromagnetic mode with this polarization on top of the usual coupling where we consider the magnetic field? coupled to the magnetization. Has anyone considered that? You see, that's a great question. It's actually, I, I well, I, I think it's kind of two steps ahead from where we are now. Uh, okay, I think formally the answer is probably yes. And I would be happy to think about that. Uh, but uh, I mean, when I started, I said this is not a cavity magnonic spot because I don't think people ever put these materials into cavity and we don't even know how they interact with the cavity. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, you have a great idea that that's indeed if, if there is a ferroelectric coupling, that would definitely help. Uh, but but uh, but that's on top of a big unknown because we know everything about yeek, but but there is a lot of I mean there is a, virtually nothing we know about the systems, and we probably before we would be able to answer the question you ask comprehensively, we will probably need to learn a lot about what's happening here. Yeah. But but that's an absolutely great question. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there was sure. something wrong with my microphone. Uh, all right. Uh, are there any further questions? So, if you're on Twitch, you can type a question in the chat box. I don't see any questions there. Uh, let me ask a quick question about this last part uh, about this. All effects with the Dirac spectrum. So what I didn't understand where the asymmetry comes from. So if you look at the K point, for example, I mean the group velocity can point in any direction um, if you're close to the K point. So when you show this that there's a preferred direction um, for the magnet, where does that come from? Yeah, like at, it, in the figure at the top. So you have yeah, no, A no, going no. to the right. I understand. Should we defer this question to later? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying. Uh, yeah, it will probably be too late for me, but. Uh... Yes, I, I see your reasoning. You are right that it's not K which is coupled, uh, but it should be velocity which is coupled. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I see the argument that we have all the velocities, but I I cannot immediately connect it. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Okay, we can come back to that later. All right, uh, so I don't see any further questions. So let's uh, thank Professor Blunter again.